Good morning, everyone. Wow, that was really great. Everyone just settled right in. <laughs> Um, so welcome to today's, today's Grand Rounds. My name is Alex Harris. I'm one of the Grand Rounds co-directors along with Drs. Rebecca Mula and Adi Talati. Next week, July 17th, we'll have a special musical Grand Rounds by Dr. Richard Kogan entitled Ragtime, The Mind and Music of Scott Joplin. Please note that Dr. Kogan's presentation will be in person only and will again be preceded by coffee and pastries. If you want to contact, contact us in general to meet with one of the upcoming speakers or to suggest a speaker, please write to us at grandrounds at nisb.columbia.edu. Before we introduce today's speaker, some housekeeping, I want to encourage everyone joining us to post on Zoom to post questions at any time during the talk using the Q&A feature, not the chat. If you're a trainee, please put the word trainee at the beginning of your question, as we'd like to uh, prioritize trainee questions uh, online and in addition here in the auditorium. Please also write, can ask question myself at the end of your question if you can do so, which we strongly encourage, and then we'll temporarily promote you to panelists so you can ask your question directly to the speaker. Today, it's a real pleasure, pleasure to welcome a leader in the field, Dr. Helen Mayberg, the founding director of Mount Sinai's Health Systems, the Nash Family Center for Advanced Cir Circuit Therapeutics. Dr. Mayberg received her MD from the University of Southern California and trained as a neurologist here at Columbia um, and then was a postdoctoral fellow in nuclear medicine in, at Johns Hopkins. Before, uh, she's had a number of different positions, but before joining Mount Sinai, Dr. Mayberg was professor of psychiatry, neurology, and radiology, and held the inaugural Do Dorothy C. Fuqua Chair in Psychiatric Neuroimaging and Therapeutics at Emory University. She's a member of the National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Inventors, was president of ACNP, I think last year. Uh, she's won dozens of awards for her work, including the American Psychiatric Association Distinguished Service Award, the ACNP Barbara Fish Memorial Award for Outstanding Contributions to Basic Translational and Clinical Neuroscience. Dr. Mayberg is renowned for her study of brain circuits in depression and for her pioneering deep brain stimulation research. More than two decades ago, she identified Broadman Area 25 as a key node in a network disrupted in severe depression and then led a research team that tested the first use of deep brain stimulation of Rodman Area 25 in patients who had become unresponsive to all available antidepressant treatments. Since then, she's been at the forefront of hypothesis-driven, cross-disciplinary approaches to developing individualized neuromodulation treatments for depression. She's published over 300 papers on these results, as well as in the fields of neuroethics and patient experience. Please give join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Mayberg. Well, it's really nice to be here. I feel like I'm sort of my home away from home. I know so many of you and have been here in various permutations over God longer than I really like to acknowledge. You know, when you can kind of stand up and think about talks in a place, I was reminiscing about Eric Kendall sitting in the first row, interrupting me. It was probably, must have been 2006, 2007. It might have been AOA lecture. Who knows what it was, but I'm sorry he's not here. He's here in spirit, you know. Um, but Roland was a great advocate, you know, our chairman of neurology at Columbia. You get old enough, the people that were very influential are gone, but they're here with us and I'm here with you. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're, thinking now about DBS for depression. I could probably take out the, the 10 slides that I stretched into an hour, you know, maybe a talk 15 years ago here, and actually could probably talk at the same slides. And you could argue maybe that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think it kind of, for the residents, there is a trajectory here and I'm going to share it with you because now the story of DBS for depression is getting more complicated, but we're still talking about it, which I think is a good thing. Um, let me get my, I've got some disclosures, um, a patent back from 2003. I consult to companies that think about this, including Abbott, which is launched to do a repeat clinical trial informed by some of the things I will tell you about, but I consulted them. All the research I will talk about today has been grant funded and industry donates devices 
they don't direct or support the work. Um, it's all been grant funded and I'm really appreciative to the Hope for Depression Foundation that got us through many, many hard years when I couldn't get NIH money. And then we've had NIH money. So I have the learning objectives. I want you to know what might impact the clinical outcome. I want you to know how you might have new ways to have readouts of what's going on with DBS. And I really want you to think about as psychiatrists is if you fix the brain, now what do you do with it and how do you rehab it? I'm gonna be talking mostly about a consortium of people. And this work requires clinicians, physiologists, um, modelers, imaging, and a lot of data scientists. So again, everybody kind of works together. And this is my current team. There's obviously it was a similar team and I kind of still have people that I work with three jobs ago. So again, it takes a village. So what really is the goal of all treatments? Basically get better and get well and stay well. And that is, that is such a truism, sorry. Got my um, my handler in the back um, telling me, someone's supposed to tell me you can't hear me. So anything I said, I just deny whatever I said because you couldn't hear me. Okay. The goal of all treatments is to get better and stay better. And how do we really put that to action? And why don't we really accomplish that? And I think that's something we ask ourselves in psychiatry all the time, that we make temporary fixes and we call it a win. If the clinical trial goes back, we throw it out, but maybe it was partly true. How do we own what the problem is and how do we fix what the problem is and know what part we fix and what part we don't? And I think that's what I've learned as a neurologist where 30 years ago, I really thought, well, you just know how the brain is wired and you'll just repair it. I've seen the light. And so I do understand how psychiatry struggles as a field to both do what you can when you can and kind of, kind of wing the rest. We have ways in which we make measurements of how, whether or not people are stronger or are in remission when they get sick again. And we'd like to have that roller coaster be different. When we think about neuromodulation, whether it's ECT or TMS or TACS or TDCS or focus ultrasound or VNS or whatever it is, it's implying that we're moving to somewhere fairly focal in the brain. And the problem with ECT is like having a bad circuit in your computer. I mean, if you unplug it, it plug it back in and it kind of works, you're happy. You don't have specificity, just like with drugs. Do you have specificity at the receptor, but do you have it at the receptor in the system you want? As soon as you think about neuromodulation, you have to think about where. And then you have to think about, because you have electricity or some other source, what do you want to have happen? Do you want something to go up? Do you want something to go down? What do you want to have happen? Not just where you want it to have happen. You got to figure out how you're going to deliver what you're going to do. And then maybe at the end, once you have any of that, the question is who's appropriate. And we can always quibble about what order we should do that in. You know, I spent most of my life thinking about predicting drug or therapy or different drugs, or how can you know how to match people to the treatment that's best for them? That's a how to use in who treatments you already know that work. When you add doing something new, you have another layer of complexity. So how did this go? So for the people probably weren't born when we started this, this is for you. Um, everybody else can just kind of sing along because they kind of know this tune. This all started by, can you take depressed people, put them in a scanner, look at the resting state and see anything wrong with their brain? Yes or no? The answer is yes. This is a 1994 spec scan on a depressed person versus a non-depressed. It's not even an average brain. That's what we were seeing. Low frontal activity. Best replicated finding was low frontal activity. People thought left more than right. That guided many things over many years, including TMS. And that 
when you throw people in a scanner again, after you give them a treatment, name it, and they get better, what happens? Well, in our hands, again, taking PET scans, glucose metabolism, resting state, ancient scans, it's a 20-year-old study that actually hypofrontality corrects, but it turns out that it isn't just refilling a low frontal lobe. It turns out that other things happen in the brain as well. And when you can analyze the whole brain, what we found was, gee, what's the insula doing there? It wasn't abnormal to start, but it downregulated its metabolism. And same with this area, the subcolossal cingulate, which we had to look up in an atlas because who knows what area 25 is. I didn't name it, Broadman did, 1900. It's just an area of the brain, a granular ventral cingulate. Subcolossal just describes where it is. But this area, without any a priori hypothesis, wasn't abnormal to start, downregulated with successful treatment. We started to go, what's area 25 about? What part of depression recovery is it going with? So we threw people in the scanner again. We made them sad. We saw that we couldn't separate a frontal cortex from this area 25. They were yoked. And if you follow the TMS literature, that's what they bank on. Find the area of frontal cortex that's anti-correlated with area 25. But in our hands, when you provoke people to be sad, you activated area 25 you in essence had the opposite pattern of what we had seen with treatment. And that kind of led to kind of a working catalog of regions that seem to be involved in depression, whether it's a baseline, whether it's with the treatment, whether it's with the provocation, you start just really collating brain regions. But what we started to observe that as we tried other treatments that worked, what happened in the brain, just mapping what happened, there were lots of patterns with different treatments, but that there seemed to be a common pattern with many treatments that if area 25 didn't decrease this activity, you didn't get well. And that became the organizing principle um, that I'm gonna talk about. Now, you might kind of say, okay, if you've got people well, what's really the problem here? We can get people well, you can get people well. I don't get anybody well except an experiment, hopefully, but that once you have a depression, some people have one episode, it goes away. Many people have recurrent episodes and you treat them, but in the experience, successive episodes of depression can get harder to treat. But we got a whole bag of tools to do that. You add other drugs, you try different drugs, but it's kind of like whack-a-mole. You get most of the symptoms better, some remain, Having residual symptoms puts you at risk to have a repeated episode. We're certainly not fixing the problem. We're kicking the can down the road. And the literature, and I'm sorry, I don't have the citation from Star D, the more episodes you have, the longer that even if I, you can get well with the treatment that you stay well a year, gets diminishingly small. And that's if you work in the ECT clinic, people come in, you can get them out of an episode often, thankfully, but that they often relapse within six months, often sooner. So Paul Holtzheimer and I were trying to write about this many years ago and kind of what is this state of not just depression, but actually when you go off the cliff where you no longer can move in and out of sick or well or better, you know, less sick, more sick, but actually you get stuck totally. And when you really talk to nonlinear dynamics, people about this, they go, oh, they're in an attractor. And I've had Terry Sednowski tell me that, no, you shouldn't model what you're talking about as a funnel attractor. You should think about it as a line attractor. We're moving along a line in our life. We move in and out of attractor states. And it's, it's a continuum that has a horizontal and a vertical. I just want to kind of plant that idea. We spent, I don't know, three years trying to get this modeling paper published um, from a computational group in Spain. And when I go back and read it, it's really uh, a valuable paper, their paper. And um, I was lucky enough to kind of participate. It was very influential to me. So 
How does this set up why you would think to stick an electrode in somebody's brain in a place? What are we trying to treat? And what was really the idea? Well, as one of our re most recent patients who's done fabulously well, but was a graphic artist, illustrated for us the state of what William Styron called that he wasn't treatment resistant. He just didn't know it until he got treated. That state of immobility where you can't think and you can't move. What is it like to actually feel terrible and not be able to move away? Patients often describe it as this being stuck underwater, drowning in a hole. They, You all know those metaphors. This patient drew it in this way. We had a model that um, we had overactive 25 that is yoked to frontal cortex and a bunch of other regions. If we can, if you can't drug, talk, shock this region into proper balance, maybe we can push it along with focal stimulation because in Parkinson's disease, DBS at high frequency gives you a depolarization block. Turns out that's wrong. But at the time, that was how it was conceptualized to work. Parkinson's has an abnormal oscillation that you block. And as soon as you turn it off, it pops back. There is no abnormal oscillation measurable in depression. But the concept was high frequency will decrease the activity. That's what our PET scans tell us we want. So we'll put it in, turn it on, we'll decrease area 25 and everything that's connected to it will somehow magically maybe recalibrate. Sounds really stupid. Honest to God, that's really how we thought about it. Sometimes having only a small amount of knowledge when somebody can do something safely is actually really helpful because if I'd actually known what I know now, I know I probably never would have ever have done this. So I think that sometimes you just need enough, but you need to be safe to try something. You just need to know when to get out if it's not going well. And so that's what we did. We said, we can look at an atlas. This is anatomy only with MRI. This is a Schulten brand atlas. We looked up what we want. Gee, there's a very nice juicy spot where subcolosal cingulate surrounds the cingulate bundle. Okay, that's good. We can read monkey anatomy and we can understand the connectivity pattern that you need to be midline, not over here under the caudate, you'll be in a totally different system. Put in two electrodes under this anatomical guidance, put in a battery pack, turn it on at high frequency, nothing fancy, use exactly what was working for 10 years before with Parkinson's disease. Here are the parameters, turn it on, watch what happens. Luckily, nothing bad happened. But what we saw is even in the first week, people changed. People changed in the operating room, but we weren't really sure if we believed it or not because not everybody had it. But that as you gave stimulation just and watched people over six months, open label, that people got better. And this is just to cut to the chase because I want to get to more detail, whether it was the first six people, the second 20 people, done by people in Toronto, another group done at Emory, different surgeons, different psychiatrists, but people that are ECT resistant, tried at least four drugs, psychotherapy, who are in this state without comorbidity, put it there, turn it on, do it this way, and you watch a majority of people get better. 60%, then 80%, then 40%. And if you follow this literature, it went very bad when a clinical trial was done to do it based on this work. Did it really go bad? It turned out, I don't have a slide on it, but I'll just have it aside because I really want to talk about the science. No real knowledge about the precision of implant, no real rules about who to pick, a randomized placebo controlled done by 20 teams with different surgeons, you know, think about in a, in a pivotal trial for a drug, they've worked out the dose. They've worked out the, they've worked out many things differently than all or none in device trials. Device trials are brutal. 
because you have to wait till you know what you're going to do. And everyone is impatient in industry, my opinion. So the trial did 100 people, six months outcome, randomized, blinded, sham controlled. The expectation was there'd be like a 15 to 20% placebo response rate and at least a 40% active response rate. And at six months, it they looked at a futility analysis. It wasn't futile, but it turned out that active did not beat sham because nobody was really getting better at six months. It was a 20% response rate in both groups pretty much at six months. There's a little more in the active than the sham, but I'm averaging. But at two years of ongoing active stim, because unlike a drug trial, you don't take the device out unless someone wants it out. People were getting benefit. And it was the plan was open label after the first blinded six months. And at 18 months, it was a 50% 50 response rate. That was sustained at two years. So please and go read the Lancet Psychiatry paper. People only read the abstract, see if see a failed trial was a halted trial, not a failed trial, so it never reached its endpoint. But actually, the abstract doesn't say that open label in those patients who were on average sick 12 years had failed, 80% failed ECT, actually had a sustained 50% response rate at two years. Doesn't pass the FDA. That's something to pay attention to because that means something not to the world. That was, everybody knows it doesn't work, throw it out. So again, for the, for the residents, got to hang in there because in fact, you can't get a grant. You can't get a paper published because, hey, everybody knows it doesn't work. And I'm going to show you what we knew because we were taking care of patients, not from the trial because we weren't in the trial, but actually our own patients looking at them closely and doing the research. And it's really fascinating about how does one translate experimental work, whether it's in an animal to people or in people where you actually have opportunity for reverse translation or opportunities to do pseudoscience with these tools that are pretty lousy that we have for people compared to animals, but what you can do when you look. So we need to figure out how can we reconcile these failed big experiments with what we know to be true, both in the experiments with people doing well? So let's just look at the data and see what happened. And it really comes down again to even deciding what to do. Where are you going to go? What do you expect to have happen? What does happen? And then how or when can you tweak it to actually improve what you may be seeing? And I'm a neurologist. so. Where's going to be my fallback position? Back to the origin story. Got to figure out where you are. Where in the brain are you? Because you've got an electrode that's a millimeter and a half in, in, in diameter with a contact that's a millimeter by, you know, you know millimeter, 1.5 millimeters cubed. Where am I putting it? Yeah, we were looking at imaging. We would all sit and vote by looking at an MRI in the operating rooms like a party before surgery. But what are we actually doing? We're trying to drop a needle into a haystack. We knew it was a haystack. We had no idea it was a haystack because who'd ever looked at a diffusion scan? We sure didn't have one then, but then we did. And so what we worked out was that we are not in a node. We're in a network. And that by actually understanding Area 25's connections and what it's connected to, what were we hitting consistently in our patients who got well? And by having tractography, we were able to model the actual tracks that went with what we were stimulating in the people who got well. Wasn't worried about the people who didn't get well for this exercise. If you're well, we own it. What are we stimulating consistently in everyone? And if it's not the same thing, if not every voxel in standard space is in this map of tractography, then that's not the right logic. And it turned out that this is the map that everybody shared. Every responder shared every voxel in this map, which means that now you can plan a surgery 
by driving around on a patient's individual tractography map and find the place that gives you cingulum buddle forceps minor, uncinate, and the subcortical fibers to the hypothalamus and the thalamus and the raphe. So this is the same kind of logic that you can take for other targets that people are doing. People target the medial forebrain bundle. People target the ventral striatum, anterior limb of the internal capsule. People, and when you look at those maps in the published targets, we are not doing the same thing. Different targets are getting people well, but they're getting into the system in different ways, in the same way that ketamine doesn't work the same as fluoxetine. And, and we, we think about the pharmacology and which part is necessary and sufficient. But even when you think about uh, a target like this, and this is totally different from what you get at with TMS. TMS is in the lateral system. TMS is looking at, it's not even in this map, it's the lateral frontal cortex to the parietal cortex. So it moves in lateral systems, whereas what we're doing stays in the midline, the, the limbic system. And I think, you know, the idea that the limbic system as a concept has been thrown out. Broca was very smart. He called the cingulum bundle the great limbic lobe whenever he did it hundreds of years ago. And we all know him for describing language systems. He described was the origin story of the limbic system. It was Papes who actually read Broca to actually better articulate what were the connections. It was Paul McLean, the triune brain, that then actually translated what Papes was doing for all of us. And then we threw out McLean's theories of um, the triune brain and the lizard brain. Don't ever throw anybody out. Everybody's right, just not at the same time. And then we live to come back and to see how. So what became our approach with multiple small studies? That the red is the first group in Toronto where we didn't do tractography guidance. People got better. But when we started to use tractography guidance and leave it alone, not make any changes, just live or die by the place that the tractography map said was the best place. Not only did we get, when we first turned it on, get a big effect very reliably. This is a month off, never went back to where you started. Something was happening when you're in the right place. You get an acute effect, it gets sustained with a month off, and then you start it again, and then it's kind of slower and it bumps around. This blue line was the second cohort done similarly. We did even better. This is because we had more DBS in the operating room. We gave more upfront, sort of interesting. Again, stable. Then we got a big priming effect. But, you know, these people bump around. This is new set of patients, new surgeon, new psychiatrist. These are patients that have a month off. And here you can see when you turn it on, here are patients where we start them now immediately out of the operating room. There's no safety problem. We get a acute effect. Then we get a chronic effect. But there's something really funny that happens over time. And that's what we're going to talk about. The other thing I want to show you is once you know this map, we got all the data from the broaden, from the failed trial, those 100 people where they had no tractography. And Ki Sung Choi, our uh, imaging expert, went through with his graduate student and basically modeled in the human connectome what the tracks were in the people who were great at two years versus the people who not got, never got better in two years. And the neurosurgeon sat and blamed the psychiatrist for picking bad patients, and everybody tried to figure it out. Couldn't prove it, but you know what I'm going to tell you. Here are the patients that did great, perfect, forceps minor, cingulum bundle, both sides, little side view. If you didn't get better, and we took all the patients from Atlanta, Toronto, and Broaden, you didn't get better because you missed the left cingulate. If you don't hit the target, don't expect it to work. Dead stop. That's the only change, really, that Abbott will do in doing this again, that they've now got a de-risking of part of the experiment. I had to do the experiment. The fact that we told them, 
in 2008, please don't do this. We're working out the tractography. No, 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 they're in a hurry. There is no joy in being right. And that doesn't guarantee that this will go well either because there's all the other things that will go wrong, but at least it will be done with tractography guidance and nobody will get getting stim that isn't in the right place. So what can we then do now that we have this knowledge? We know where to put it reliably. These patients say all kinds of amazing things. You talk to depressed people all the time. They're trying to come up with a way to tell you what their experience is. I have no idea in neurological terms what tension, poison, force field, vortex. Everybody's got a thing that they describe. I feel terrible. I can't move. Something's in my way. And you hit the switch, and that's the thing that changes. That goes away. To me, that's core. The rest is adaptation. And people say amazing things. It's always cool to hear them talk about it. We all come to tears every case when you listen to what someone says. It's very moving. It doesn't get old. Even an engineer sits and listens to this in an operating room. It's subtle, but powerful. But the question is, okay, how do I measure that? You can measure it by in the OR, looking at the electrophysiology in the target before you start, know where you are, give the stimulation, give it for 10 minutes. What happened at the end when you turn it off? And it turns out you can do fancy machine learning classification of the local field potential, or you can just look at the power spectral density on average of nine out of nine people having this effect. And you can see that before versus after there's this broadband decrease in low frequency, kind of 10 hertz to 20 hertz. It's a combination alpha, beta suppression, bilateral. And on the right side, you also have an alpha increase. It's not a pure beta suppression, but that the magnitude, here's everybody's one week post-op Hamilton dropped. There's not getting any stim. So this is just the effect of stim in the OR with this effect. The magnitude on the left side goes with how well they're doing a week later. Couldn't get this published. Why not? Because it didn't predict how you were doing in six months. Can't cut a break, right? Nine out of nine. Okay. What did that mean? Acute effects are cool, interesting, informative. That's not about being well. So why didn't it predict what was happening later? But I do want to say this idea of knowing where you are, what's happening acutely, looking at oscillations, thinking about how am I going to get the rest of the story is there in animal models. Clement Hamani, one of our surgeons who runs an animal lab in Toronto, he, he basically burned out with imitinic added all the neurons in infralimbic area 25 equivalent and then gave stim you can reverse the four swim test. This was never about area 25. It was about the connections. And then the question is, Carl Dysroff wanted to know, well, connections where? Well, connections to at least three places I showed you. His team looked at channel rhodopsin in infralimbic and then stimulated in the RAFA. And what happens when you do that? You get a stupid rodent trick. You can make the rodents for swim test. You can make an animal that's despairing, not despair by trying to escape by stimulating those fibers from impolimbic to the raphe. If you excite area 25, you can block the positive effects of the VTA to the accumbens. So that, and Oldson Milliner showed this in 1953, that if you compete with a positive reinforcing thing with something negative, it's less reinforcing increasing positive doesn't override negative. They're independent. But that it just really shows that if you block serotonin totally in this model with, with what Clement did, you actually block the DBS effect. So serotonin is involved. Area 25 is the highest concentration of CERT transporter in the brain. So there's something about that area. There's a reason we saw it way back with fluoxetine, because that's where serotonin is having 
one of its effects on cortex and it's an important effect. So we can get to where we can use other measures to understand target engagement, where we are in the brain. We can use evoke potential, ping in area 25 off the electrode, watch what happened on the cortical surface. And when you're in the right place, everybody has this same 100 millisecond signature. Everybody, they keep having it over time. You can differentiate on that electrode between three millimeters being in the right place. Here's someone where two adjacent contacts are the same. Their pattern looks similar. Here's someone where you get out of target and you can tell on the cortical surface, you don't, you can't really get it with behavior. You can start to think about, I can use dose. Maybe I can figure out a starting dose for someone because that's the only thing we ever change. And we can start to get fancy with deconstructing is the singular more important than forceps minor? What part of the signature is going with stimulating what and thinking about brain dynamics in different ways. But the real important thing really is about what happens beyond the acute effects. Because just like we've learned with ketamine, it's fantastic when the next day you wake up and you're well, or you get psilocybin and you get it and you, you have an epiphany and you're no longer sick. It's about what happens next. How long does it last? We've learned with ketamine that there's plastic effects, but you need to repeat them. The first effects are super interesting, necessary, but not sufficient. Same way here. So how do I know that? Because you can look at this early, very reproducible effect, and then you see noise. And when do you see noise? You see noise after a while. Now, if you're a psychoanalyst, you go, well, you know, how do I cope with my, this new state that I'm in when I haven't been well? You know, how does this fit into my life milieu? Um, you hear that from the families. Well, you've been good for nothing for the last five years and now you look really different. When are you going to do something? When are you going to get a job? Gee, you're finally not incapacitated. Now I'm leaving you. I mean, people's lives can either get stronger or devolve as you get better. That happens when you treat people with epilepsy. This happens all the time with families when you do DBS for Parkinson's. As soon as you're independent, I'm out of here. I don't really want to live with you with your chronic illness. I mean, this is your bread and butter if you're not a pure psychopharmacologist, right? How do we deal with the whole person? And are we seeing something about the device, something about biology, or something about life? That's what makes this just so hard because I wish I knew. We don't know how to model life. We try to do naturalistic experiments. We try to get brain signals. They're more random. We need pathology and undoing pathology to kind of track a signal that we want to then do prospectively. We do these retrospective and then prospective analyses. And here's why I feel really strongly about this philosophically. Here's one person's Hamilton. Hey, they got this great effect. They're doing well. Yellow line is when the doctor decided to turn up the dose. It's the only thing we let him do. Why didn't they do it here? They decided that wasn't a real wobble. But why didn't they do it here? Well, because they were talking to the patient. They decided it wasn't a real wobble. But here it was. Okay, please write the, the script for an industry to figure out how to make that decision, right? We're doomed. Clinically doomed without rules. Here's another patient. They had an effect. It's kind of more modest, but they're doing okay here. They start to bump up here. The, the psychiatrist decided right away to do something. Well, was it because they learned from this patient? Not necessarily. How do you make a decision of when to wait, when to turn it up, when to add a med? That's really where we are now. And so how do we do that? The, just like we had tractography, let us learn how to do the DBS implant more precisely and feel confident about how to deliver the treatment and watch what happens. Now that you don't get to ever change where it is, we know people eight or nine out of 10 will get better. 
we can take advantage of that with a new tool that lets us track the local field potential off of Area 25 basically all the time. So we now have a monitoring device built into the DBS system because half of that battery will deliver the stem and half of the battery has now got a sensor. Not a great sensor, but sure better than nothing. And what we're able to do is we, we set it to make recordings with the stem on eight times a day, but we brought them when they came in to get evaluated by the, by the team once a week, turned it off, got a very clean recording and looked to see what was going on. So over six months, we had 26 recordings to basically build a model. And because people have gotten better, here's how these, this is the training set of five patients. Here they are at the, the first month. They're different. They're below enrollment criteria, but they're, they're certainly not well. And at the end, they're stably well. So we basically made a rule. We're going to model the local field potential with a classifier of what's happening at the end versus what's happening at the beginning. We're assuming everybody is having something happen the same. We didn't assume everybody's got a different signal as many teams are doing. Said, we're doing the same thing. Something must be the same, yes or no, with the LFP. Built a tra classifier. So Chris and Shankar are two engineers at Georgia Tech, neuroscientists, engineers. They're not just engineers. They built a classifier to basically look at well versus sick. And you can make a very, very clear distinction between the end and the beginning just off of the local field potential in area 25. And then we went and said, okay, here's the rule. If that's the end versus beginning, when do you convert from being a sick brain to a well brain based on the brain signal, not the score, the brain signal. And you track it every week. And it turns out that there's a place where there's a transition. People transition in different ways. And then we asked how well it was that this brain signal with a threshold could say sick or well. With well defined as two weeks in a row, Hamilton 50% drop never vacillates over a 50% drop for more than a week. So if you hung at 49% change, you're not well. If you, even if you vacillated two weeks in a row, that makes you not stably well. We applied that rule and it did pretty well. And then we were able to look for explainability by looking at what features of the local field potential are driving this. And it turns out to be dominantly like the acute effect, beta, but it's low beta. It's not like motor beta. It's really in the, the 12 to 14, 15 Hertz range, but it's not just beta. So, um, and we've now replicated this on a second device with a new group of people using the exact same model, didn't rebuild the model, just applied it in the new group. So I think it's Keeper. And, um, but here's the rub. One company has got a device with a tracker signal. Everybody else that does DBS doesn't have a tracker signal. My nightmare, if I remembered them, would be um, what's Abbott gonna do because Abbott doesn't have a device with a tracker signal. So they're gonna have to do it old school. Gotta make rules. What are gonna be the rules to make changes? You can see where life is not fair. You know, when it, if you have your own company, I guess, it's your rules, your money, you can do what you want. We, and again, I'm saying this, I gave you my disclosure, I consult to them. You can consult. They, they pay you to consult, they don't need to listen. And you can just use the data to help them to know what to do. But what can be another way to get a signal? Because in the real world, who's gonna do LFP? Even when Parkinson's, people don't use those LFP signals all the time, even though they, Medtronic spent a fortune to develop adaptive DBS have the device tell you what to do, make adjustments based on a very clear Parkinson's signal. Neurologists don't have time. You've got to really learn how to do that. Just like everybody doesn't take care of TRD, not everybody does ECT. The hard patients are really hard. 
and expertise. That's why they're depression experts or OCD experts or schizophrenia experts. You learn to be a generalist and then how do you do it when it gets tough? What are ways that we can have objective readouts? Everybody wants an objective readout. A Hamilton is not the objective readout. It's just a number based on self-report. It works. It's the best we've got, but can we do better? And here's an idea, and it's something that we know. And, you know, I'm becoming like that old neurologist thing. Like, so there was always a joke in neurology training. If anybody asked you when, you know, who's the first one to describe, you know, this syndrome, you just basically pulled up some French neurologist from the 18, you know, from the 18th century. And you were generally right because they kind of described everything. And, you know, that group also trained Freud. I mean, you know, think about it. If Freud had had a scanner, there probably wouldn't be a New York Psychoanalytic Institute, but, you know, just, but think about how these observations people made when you just had to talk to people, look at people, we all know when someone walks into your office or walks down the hall, what's wrong with them or have a pretty clear clue. And people who are depressed look funny, walk bad, they're hunched, they look Parkinsonian if they have that melancholic flavor. And Darwin was studying Duchenne and Ekman kind of built a model around it, you know, many, many years later that your face is the window to the brain. The eyes are too, but eyes are in your face. And there's a wiring diagram of how your face moves. An emotional face is what happens when you have an anterior cerebral artery stroke and you're an akinetic mute. You can volitionally move your face very, very slowly, but basically your intention to move is gone and your emotion of your face is gone and it's symmetric even though you can still move your face. Whereas you get a lateral stroke, emotionally, it'll move symmetrically. Singulate, where we're in is super important. And what did we do in that same data set where we got that brain signal? We said, hey, maybe we can use those weekly videos and model what's happening in the face and do the same exact thing. The face changed at the end versus the beginning. Can you build a model? Yes, you can. How does it perform? Super well. The problem is it isn't the same model for every person, but everybody has a transition and their transition better matches the brain transition than does the Hamilton. So the face and behavior and the face and brain is better than the brain and behavior. Because the behavior is a Hamilton. Hamilton is good enough, but maybe not good enough. So what can we do now? And, you know, I was talking um, to Garib about this, you know, we can use videos. So instead of just the interview video, we have patients at home recording from their brain, recording a personal video, and we can do that twice a day. They do that twice a day for us every day indefinitely. They ask when they're well, can we stop? Maybe just do it once a day, but I'm going to show you why you want to keep having a way to keep getting these measures. Because what can we find? We can build a model. This is built with a uh, proprietary with the Hume model, which is a company in Brooklyn, I think. But basically they built a natural language, emotional face features called emotion estimates and also have pr prosodic elements about how your voice sounds. We basically used their model, plugged our video videos into their model correlate it with the behavior of the brain over time. And here you can see it went the first, the early effect, it switched. This person was doing really great and then started to have this decay function. And then we turned her up. So we used this to make a decision of when to turn her up. But here, just as an example, this is looking at all of these emotion features and it can actually correlate with this in all three dimensions, which means that you could use video as the tracker of the brain if you didn't have the brain. I hope not, but how do we want to use it? And what do I need now, a company to build me? We had an outlier patient in our, in our first group. 
This patient did really great right out of the operating room and she never deteriorated, except she did at 16 weeks and ended up in the hospital. We got a call. She was being seen every week. She was fine. And then she wasn't. Then she got turned up. What would we have done different? And this is why I think these devices matter. Here's her Hamilton. It's plugging along. It's super low. And here at 15 weeks, you can see it starts to shoot up and then it goes here and it she gets better after we turn her up. But look what her brain was doing independently. Her brain was doing great, but at 10, 11 weeks, it started to creep. She's being seen by the psychiatrist every week. Very competent psychiatrist. Hamilton is not saying anything is wrong. Her brain is saying, help me. That to me is, I need an alarm on that device. The new devices don't have an alarm. They don't even have a way for me to beam the information. Why not? Because, hey, you have to come into the office and then I'll tune you. That's what I built for, that's what they built for Parkinson's. That doesn't help me. If you're having trouble, I don't need your bloody device. I needed your device a month before to tell me you're getting into trouble. Similarly, why is the Hamilton, what is this noise late? Here's a patient. Here you can see their depression score in blue. They're sick. They get better. They're going down. Here's some wobble. They get better again. Here's another little wobble. Here's their brain. Brain says, gee, this wobble here, the brain is very stable. Okay, what's that about? What did it what did it miss? Well, if you look at the breakout on the Hamilton of what's tracking the mood interest versus anxiety, you actually see at the beginning there's an admixture and during these wobbles, it's all anxiety. This is a patient that the doctor kept turning it up because he didn't have the brain yet, not getting anywhere. You then listen to the patient, it's all rumination about being well and thinking about the past, no meds, five of Lexapro. Five days later, the rumination stopped. Four months later, with more psychotherapy that the therapist couldn't get through without the Lexapro, he was better. He did not want to take that Lexapro because that drug had stopped working. That's why it stopped it. But with the drug, with his brain in a new place, it worked. And I think this idea of how you change over time is it, and I won't bore you with this, but again, the patient, how do I know when I'm falling? If I'm falling back in the pit, well, maybe I have to reframe that, am I falling? Because look at her face. She got right back up and ran up and she's smiling. She hadn't framed it that way because maybe I'm just going up a hill and I hit a bump versus I'm falling down and I'm getting up. I mean, it's all relative, right? I mean, if you don't have a marker of, up or down and it's relative, then what the absolute is, you don't know. So what else do we know? And I've just got two more points. Is there anything that we could know to understand why people get better and get stable at different times? So if you follow this, people are getting stable brains at different times. We went back to their scans at baseline. And what it turned out is the connectivity of area 25 to the mid cingulate, as well as the white matter integrity of the entire system we were stimulating could the more damaged it was the more disconnected it was at baseline not that you wouldn't get better that it was the longer it took and we've now replicated this in all of our patients and it really looks as though the cingulum bundle is the lead character in this white matter disintegrity is predicting not if you will get better but how long it takes and when you think about these connectivity patterns, these are the areas in the brain. This is the rich club hub of where motor meets interoception, meets salience, you know, meets the default mode. If you don't have clear integration of a system that really is responsible for dynamics in the whole brain, you're going to get a mixed message. You're not paralyzed. Why do you feel like you can't move? I mean, that's goofy, right? Except it's not if you, the system that allows you to have intention to move is dynamically out of, out of sync. And what can we measure over time? 
We can measure by looking at all the networks, even with PET. We did this with PET, it was published last year. It's only the default mode that correlates with how you're doing. Other systems change, but this is one that actually tends to track the change. The default mode is the frontal lobe reaching the posterior cingulate. What connects that? The cingulum bundle. And if you look at fMRI, which we've just started to do, because we can put people back in the scanner, we can now track with fMRI what's happening. And actually the default mode is changing and the magnitude is going with how well they're doing, just like we did with the PET scan. So now we can use fMRI and we can do something with fMRI we could never do with PET. We can now look at does white matter change? And I probably should just show this one slide because it's the only thing I now care about. I, almost, okay. <laughs> if you actually go, what was broken? And now this is taking all the patients and comparing it to controls. Look at the, just taking a mask of the whole cingulum bundle. This is where it's statistically different from controls. A big area of white matter is abnormal in these patients. What's repaired? What changes at six months? You fix it. And you kind of go, I don't believe that FA stuff. That's the scanning. We did it in a monkey. So Peter Rudebeck and um, Satoka um, Fujimoto, and this is now on BioArchive. It's in review. They looked at two monkeys. They give ipsilateral stim exactly like people, except it's not a sick monkey. They look pre-post at two months. Focal changes in the cingulum bundle in healthy monkeys. And then you kind of go, yeah, it's just a scan. Well, went to the real deal. And with myelin molecular markers and then electromicroscopy at this area of maximum imaging changes, this is the side that's stimulated in the cingulum bundle and this is the side that's not. And so we're growing new myelin. And when you look at the literature on VNS, Activity-dependent plasticity with VNS is a principle. Stimulation with Michelle Mangi in terms of turning on algodendroglia and models of good plasticity like epilepsy or stress. And I think I have a, a slide on this. Here's um, Michelle Mangi's work stimulating in motor cortex, you know, 20 minutes a day in a rodent, grow new myelin. Here's a mild chronic stress model giving a drug that enhances myelin, getting myelin changes. Thinking about you know ketamine with Connor Liston's work, um, you get changes in dendrite, what happens to myelin? So I think there is now a new organizing principle of why is it with SEC DBS, you turn it off and it lasts. You can certainly stress the system and maybe re-break it, but with the stim, you're keeping up with potentially repair and now you can see why that's like my total preoccupation is not all the bundles have the same level of repair. What happens if the cingulate goes early and the forceps isn't? How do you do predictive coding? How do you learn maybe the, the area near the hippocampus? If it doesn't remodel your new neurons, like, you know, you know, we've got can't get to the frontal cortex. I mean, there's all kinds of ways we can set up experiments to think. But I think it's kind of like a broken bone. And people used to laugh at me when I would show this because you're trying to help a patient understand what rehab is. You know, you have a terrible break. Maybe you had a break because you fell, because you had arthritis, you're still going to have arthritis, but maybe you just broke your leg. Regardless, you got to fix the broken leg. Depending how bad the break is, it's going to take more time. And once you fix the broken leg and you remodel the bone, now what are you going to do with it? Now the hard work starts. You know, sometimes you can do stim and promote osteoclast growth in bone and orthopedics do that. You still have to train. You have to relearn. You have to have experiential learning, but you got to have some basics because when you're lost and now you're somewhere else, you got to figure out where you are and then you got to maximize your new place. And the patient gets that. So this patient, unbeknownst to me, was mapping she was doing her video recordings for us. Meantime, she was drawing her trajectory. Understand that she had a Hamilton of three to five starting at about two weeks. But look at her experience. She's under the weight. Now she's loose. Now she's above the tears. 
suddenly she's in a boat, except it's a sailboat and it doesn't even have a rudder. Okay, that's kind of weird. But then pretty soon she's got no sail and she looks like she's driving. Now she's not sure if she's falling and getting up. No, she decides she's climbing. And now look where she is. So again, same score, total different experience as she's moving along the line and moving in and out of little attractors. And I think that's kind of where we are. So if you're still here 20 years later and I'm still standing, I'll tell you, you know, what we do to really sculpt when you have a broken brain. I think that Broadman got area 25. I think that what we treat is a singulopathy. We return people to having depression, but we're treating a singulopathy. And the question is to understand why does the cingulate break? And I think that's something that we can model in animals and we can think about it, but this region is becoming much more important. So it's still about area 25, but it's area 25 and it's partners in the cingulate. I'll stop there. I don't like that one, sorry. Thank you for that fantastic talk. Um, trainees, you got a shout out a couple of times in the talk, so only fair for you to give back and ask some questions. Thanks so much. I'm Maz Bradbury. I'm a PGY2 resident. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, complications related to the electrode implantation uh, and residence in the brain. How many patients suffer strokes during implantation? How often do infections happen, et cetera? Sure. So um, DBS has been done for, you know, since the early 90s in Parkinson's, there's hundreds of thousands of patients that have been implanted and the um, intraoperative complications are the same no matter where you go in the brain for basic complications. You need to put someone to sleep. You need to make a burr hole, um, which means you can always have complications of anesthesia as you can with any operation. The numbers are, you know, under 1%. Um, the, and that's why people are screened to be medically healthy to undergo surgery. There is blood vessels. So the big thing about, I made a big deal about, you have to get it in the right place but you have to go through the cortical surface into the brain and pass stuff. You don't magically get it there. You put a cannula in and then you put a wire through. And it's pretty magical that you can pretty much go through the corona radiata into area 25 and you don't bump into anything. The only thing you need to not bump into along the way is if you go into the ventricle, sometimes you can have a CSF leak, but Andres Lozano, who I worked with in Toronto, he always goes very perpendicular, always goes through the ventricle. Brian Capel, my surgeon now, hates going through the ventricle. So that's surgical interest, usually can be done safely, but you can get a CSF leak, which you get a headache and it goes away. The big thing is not hitting a blood vessel. And that's why you don't go through um, sulci. You go through gyri. That's why you have pre-op, not just tractography, but multiple kinds of images. So you know exactly how to adjust your, I may tell Dr. Capel where I want him to go and he'll go, I'm going through someone's forward. We're not doing that. Or I'm going to be hitting a vessel. I've got, I'm not comfortable with that. I need to make an adjustment and we work together to maximize the tractography. So you don't want to hit a blood vessel. Hemorrhage is the main thing. You can usually anticipate a hemorrhage. If it's at the surface, it's easy to stop. You can get a seizure if you get a small hemorrhage. Usually they're self-contained. That um, Those are the big things that you worry about. You don't seem to get a, I make a, I hit something and I get a lesion. So from an operation point of view, it's really about being a good surgeon and driving safely. The post-op is about, you've made a hole in the head, you have tunneled, things through the neck, you've made a, a slit in the chest and you put a battery in. People need to heal. And the biggest thing is people can get a wound infection. If it's common, again, that's bad surgical practice. So when you have wound infections, you worry about basically the patient's 
education and keeping a wound clean. I mean, this is not neuroscience, it's common sense, but that even with a wound infection, which we've all had, I mean, we, in terms of the collective, that's a known complication of DBS. You can give IV antibiotics for six weeks. You can take out the battery. You can often leave the electrodes. Sometimes you need to take the connector cable out. People are more or less conservative and you can leave the electrodes in. It delays things and do it. We've had, where was a patient in the Broaden study that had a battery replacement five years well, got a wound infection that was missed. The entire system was removed. And basically there was no one to reimplant her for nine months because the study was halted. And she finally got reimplanted exactly in the same place and she's well again. And she actually made me this necklace. So she writes me all the time, but I, I forgot that it was her because I hadn't planned to tell that story, but you know, good luck necklace. But you can regain the effect even after a period of time. She relapsed. Um, but I think that the worry about the surgery, I've always been amazed, but I always knew this. You can take, you know, when, when you're working up somebody that has some unknown disease and where do you go? You take out someone's right piece of brain from right prefrontal cortex. That there are, there's no area of the brain that's silent, but there are a lot of areas of the brain that are redundant. The idea that you can put a, a metal cannula all the way through anywhere in the brain you want and not have trouble I think is one of the mysteries of the brain. And I think we should um, not be afraid while we're being safe. Be sure to introduce yourselves when you ask a question. Hi, I'm Stephen Heiler. I'm about a PGY 48. And this was fabulous, your presentation. I'm also a big fan of tech. So my question is, with advances in neuroimaging, artificial intelligence, machine learning recently, how do you see these technologies integrating with your real-time monitoring and adjustment of the DBS treatment for depression? Thank you for that question about kind of how to basically think about closed loop. And, you know, again, a um, team at UCSF um, has actually taken on this problem by saying, we're going to treat a depressed patient like an epilepsy patient. Everybody is different. We'll put in multiple electrodes, have them in a monitoring unit um, for 10 days. And model ups and downs of negative emotion. And then we'll figure out where to stimulate is best for them. And then we'll train the model that basically a device that this used for epilepsy, they use the responsive nerves, you know, the RNS system that they use for epilepsy will turn on only when it's needed. It turned out in their first patient, which was fabulous case in nature medicine a couple of years ago, they ended up in the nucleus accumbens measuring the readout off the amygdala. And when gamma went up, they gave a buzz and it turned it down and person really liked it as everybody does when you stimulate the nucleus accumbens. And um, they found that it was going off 300 times a day and they had to turn it off at night. They had to find and fine tune it because it was kind of like behaving like intracranial self stim in terms of, but she did get, the patient did get better until she got COVID and then the signal changed. So one of the things about building these models up front, in my opinion, is that if you think everybody is different, then you'll never be able to replicate because each person will be their own model. Our data would say, so I will address the question of why don't I have a closed loop system, which was one of the thinking when we started, even though we make very few changes, maybe we could just turn it on let it coast and turn it on when you need it. Because maybe maybe once you remodel the brain, you shouldn't take it out, but you should keep it for later and you need the alarm to tell you when. So the question is not how to not use the AI, but when to use the AI? What signal do you train it on? I don't think based on our own data, I want to turn it on every time somebody has a bad day. Or maybe I need a different signal for moment-to-moment -moment fluctuations, which I think is more what UCSF has built so far versus what is this slow signal. Um, I think that now with this preoccupation with remodeling the, the backbone, once you remodel it, maybe actually you can do repair 
with something that doesn't need the device. So maybe you know how damaged someone is. They have a fixed amount of time that you remodel and then you can do touch-ups, you know, um, with a different method. So I think the question is, is it, whereas with PTSD, people at UCLA have modeled with PTSD with when you're set off, they found a signal in the amygdala that maybe you don't need it on all the time. With depression, maybe you need it on all the time for a period of time until you remodel and then you need closed loop. I think what where we are right now, which is why I'm, I feel sort of confused but excited, is that it's that kind of point where we know a lot to kind of think about all the things we don't know. And I think the, you know, people want like with the BBQS grant at NIMH call, they want something implanted in the brain and they want to read out that goes with behavior. That's a wonderful blue sky project. Trust me, what I get all the time with this is you're, you're a first world treatment. How are you ever going to scale that? I'm worried about my next grant. I'm worried about Abbott's trial with however many people they will do. I'm not thinking about how we take care of every depressed person in the world. And I don't think that's my job right now. On the other hand, how do we reverse engineer? If you can remodel, and that's important, then we ought to be trying to figure out how we remodel without having to put a device in someone. So I think there's different disorders will have episodic things, panic attack. Would I want a device to have it buzz when I'm having a panic attack? Maybe not. Maybe, you know, anxiety disorders might lend themselves better. I'm not sure that depression needs the moment to moment to be making the adjustments. And right now I'm not quite sure what the right, you know, experiment will be. So I'm going to kind of watch UCSF and see how it works for them once they get, get past, you know, their, their one publication. But I think, you know, the idea of we have to know so much about the brain to make this investment when you do the implant. I love listening to Elon Musk, you know, talk trash. You know, it's his aspiration. BCI has been around a long time. People know a lot about the motor system. You got a better mousetrap, power to him. He made it portable. He's made it miniaturized. He's got to work out the details with the electrodes coming out of the head, just a small thing. I'm not kidding. I mean, I'm I'm joking, but I'm sort of horrified. Talk is talk. It, the qu question is, more complex is a great grant. More complex is a terrible treatment. Never scales. And I think, how do we do exactly what you say in a smart way and have it not take 20 years to kind of know fast to fail, right idea? And how do we use technology now that everyone has developed to do, could it be um, temporal interference? Where you can get deep, I've seen some data on that. The effect sizes are very small, but you can get deep. Can you use focus ultrasound and remodel the brain? Maybe you can. But the question is, how do you keep it from breaking again? And that's where I think this combination of the device, but the neuroscience of stress, stress biology, kind of pharmacology, how to use these combinatorial treatments. But once it's broken, it's just broken. You know, you still got to take your hypertensive drugs and your insulin after somebody gives you a heart transplant or does a stent, you're not scot-free, but you're going nowhere with a blocked artery. So rambling. Um, hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. I'm Moshe, I'm a PhD student. Um, I can't remember if you mentioned already, but uh, do you know the mechanism for why you think the DBS has you sustained uh, OPC generation and are you trying to toggle the parameters to get more of an enhanced effect there? So right now we've just made this observation. So what can we toggle to improve it? I don't know if, I mean, so Michelle Manji's models in rodents were at 60 Hertz because she was optogenetically delivering it. We're at 130 Hertz. Is there a tuning frequency that's optimal for oligos? I think now that we see an oligo signal, we ought to be asking ourselves, what is the microglia oligo balance? And what are we doing to microglia? Uh, I put my order in, don't know. You know, I think the idea is it lets us reverse 
engineer what to look for now. I'm trying to figure out, is there a relationship between cingulate and forceps or cingulate and the uncinate near the hippocampus? Because there is a change near the hippocampus. The whole, whereas the whole cingulate kind of tends to change, but it changes maximally where it's most damaged. Trying to figure out if it's the same as you're near the insula or the hippocampus. It may be that different pathways need different tuning frequencies. In the same way, I was reviewing um, Paula um, Arlada's work on development and the idea of if you have post-mitotic changes in neurons in cortex, they're tuning different circuits in different way and they're changing um, myelin in different ways. So I think that not all bundles respond why can I turn a Parkinson's patient off and they immediately get their tremor back? They're behaving as though there's no remodeling. Um, maybe we're not looking in the right place. Maybe we should be not going in the basal ganglia only for Parkinson's and maybe we could remodel some. I think that we don't know. And I think that you're working on your PhD. So maybe you can figure out where we should look. Hi, uh, Mar Boldrini, Professor of Psychiatry here. Um, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. I have a couple of anatomy questions. Uh, you you were referring to uh, left and right. And if I understand correctly, you were saying that the effect uh, needs to be on the left to be um, real uh, happening. And, and I wonder if you think then based on that, we should be studying the left hemisphere in human brain and then referring to uh your you talking about uh pain um how how much do we know about the connectivity of uh, area 25 with the thalamus so the last one let me tell you so area 25's projection to the thalamus area 25 is a very funny place in the brain if you read um all of the track tracing of thalamic projections, we always think about, you know, through the thalamic radiations to the frontal cortex and medial thalamus. Area 25 and the adjacent ventral medial frontal cortex, but really the cingulate, projects down the midline and goes to the reunions and paraventricular thalamus. It does not use the anterior limb of the internal capsule in either direction. It has a very privileged pathway. Its projection to the raphe is interesting because the raphe also goes to the reunions as well as to the habenula. So this negative GABA dopamine reward prediction error system, infralimbic, raphe, habenula, midline thalamus participate, and it's different from the lateral system. It also goes to the core of the accumbens rather than the shell. And so its topography has some unique qualities. It's a visceral motor output system. So it's not so much that 25 is talking to the mid cingulate. The mid cingulate and 25 are going to the body in similar ways. And 25 is maybe going subcortically and then back up to mid cingulate, which goes to the body. So I think with tractography, you can be very fooled because it doesn't have arrows, but there's other work with having arrows. So I think in terms of the thalamus and thinking about pain, you know, this part of the dorsal cingulate with affective pain versus somatic pain, this particular region at the hub is slightly posterior to the pain matrix area. So I think the details in the anatomy of the cingulate are really relevant and the projections in the thalamus are super relevant. And even the TRN thalamus may be, because area 25 goes to the TRN thalamus and limbic systems inhibit the TR, are preferentially impacting the TRN. So if the TRN is locked down by the limbic inputs, no other sensory inputs, can get into the thalamus. So maybe that first effect is just the thalamus coming back online. Um, I didn't talk about some of the new things we have with real-time voltammetry in the OR. That'll need to be another time, but 
there are chemical changes and they're not restricted to one transmitter. The, the other thing you said about the left and right is important. So when we built the model, we had left and right LFP. It's a combined signal. We always see a bigger self-report with left-sided stem than right-sided stem. The is that because the left hemisphere can express itself differently than the right side? Possibly, but you need both because Paul Holzheimer went to Dartmouth and did a right versus left, didn't work. That one side alone wasn't enough. So I would not be purporting, even if the biggest signal is on the left, that you need both. The one thing that I saw yesterday from the team was that in the newest data, even though the model behaves the same with the contributions of both sides, left beta, right gamma was our original finding, that didn't work in the next cohort. But that the left side is the most predictive, the left beta and it's low beta is the most reliable substitute. On the right side, it can be quite good, but it's a different signal than the left. And we're testing now whether may, it may be more the source of the instability. The left side is binary. The right side seems to have more play. So I clearly, the two hemispheres do not do the same thing. Right side, even in anxiety, it's always right insula more than left in anxiety, even in all of the mood inductions, always right more than left for emotional interceptive phenomena. I think we need to pay attention to that. I think you, now that we have the signal, then we can tease it apart a little bit and maybe explain more of the variance. So I think the two sides, but I would, I would hesitate to bet on one side or the other as being adequate. All right, thank you so much. I know there are still questions here in the auditorium and several on Zoom. We're going to send those to you by email so okay. you can get those. Oh, a homework assignment. <laughs> exactly. That's my punishment <laughs> for talking too much. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming and thank you. Thank you.